probably heard the phrase, if you die in your dream, you die in real life. I've always been skeptical of this phrase. I've never thought that phrase was logical. How does a figment of your imagination cause your mortal self to die? I kept believing that a dream was a dream, and nothing in your dreams actually happened unless it was some sort of flashback. But that all changed when I decided to create my own sleep experiment. Because of that experiment, I now believe that it is possible to lose your life from a terrifying experience in your dream. Do you want to know my story? Go ahead, listen on. But you might regret knowing of my experience. I've always had a scientific mind. I analyzed everything and thought of other possibilities before I came to a conclusion. Thus, I was an honor roll student Straight A's in all of my classes, except gym. Boy, how I hated physical activity. Anyways, because of my highly inquisitive, scientific mind, I have always been a skeptic of many theories and superstitions. No matter how much proof there is to back up a theory, I know that eventually, there will be a factor that completely destroys that theory. You could say I'm a little crazy because Isaac Newton's law of motion are extremely accurate, but that's just the way I see the world. So now you know why I didn't believe how the phrase, if you die in your dreams, you die in real life, could possibly be logical. But of course, my scientific mind decided to test it. For one week, I decided to do nothing but watch horror films and read creepypasta to trigger paranoia and cause nightmares. Hopefully, I would trigger a nightmare that causes me to die, and eventually, wake up, thus disproving that superstition. And so this experiment began. Sunday, June 3rd, 2012 So today, I spent over 10 hours watching classic horror films and reading creepypasta. I have to admit, the stories were quite unnerving, but I didn't find them that scary. However, before I went to sleep that night, I couldn't help but think that there was someone out there looking for me. I finally settled down and went to sleep. I woke up in a dark room that reeked of human decay. I was tied to a wooden slab, and I realized I could not even struggle. That's when I saw a shadowy figure in the corner of the room. Don't even bother struggling, the figure said, the voice that sounded raspy and crazed. I injected you with a serum that causes temporary paralysis. At this point, I was panicking. I kept trying to struggle, even though I knew it wasn't possible because I was temporarily paralyzed. I kept trying and trying and trying, but it was no use. I was immobilized. That's when the figure turned towards me. He slowly moved forward, pulls out a knife, possibly getting ready to gut me alive. That's when I saw his face. I woke up. Unfortunately, I woke up before I could be killed in my nightmare. But I will never forget that nightmare. It was so lucid. It was almost like it was real. It felt real too. And that face. That face was just so frightening. That figure had the eyes of a demon. They seemed to stare directly into your soul. His skin wasn't pale, like most psychopathic murderers, but it was more blackened. It appeared as if his face was smeared with blackened makeup. But of course, it was all a dream, right? 
that thing couldn't possibly be real. At least, that's what I thought. Monday, June 4th, 2012. I spent another 10 hours watching horror films and reading Creepypasta. All of it seems very far-fetched, especially Slenderman, who I knew could not possibly exist. And slasher films tend to over-exaggerate the psychopathic tendencies of murderers. However, that same feeling of paranoia continued through my veins. I still managed to settle down. This time, it was many years into the future. It was proven that there is life on other planets, and their technology was millions of years ahead of human technology. They decided to invade. Humanity was desperate. We ran frantically, hoping to gain shelter from the oncoming alien invasion. I kept hearing laser rifles being blasted everywhere, and I also kept hearing a droning sound, possibly the sounds coming from the extraterrestrials' vessels. To humanity's dismay, we were not safe. They had found us and captured every one of us. I blacked out and woke up in what appeared to be a scientific laboratory. I saw many people being experimented on by the extraterrestrial beings, and that's when I saw a bright white light. I woke up too early once again. So far, this experiment seems to be failing. I can never stay asleep to the point where whatever was coming at me would eventually kill me. Since this experiment lasted a week, and considering how lazy some people are when listening to long stories, I've decided to cut out some of my journals and skip ahead to the final night of the experiment. After all, I don't think you, the listener, would want to listen to a week's worth of dream journals. Saturday, June 9th, 2012 It's the final day of my experiment. I have spent 60 hours of my life watching horror films. Time to go for another 10. This time, however, I never felt that unnerved this time. Since I began doing this experiment, I have gradually become less and less freaked out by horror films and creepypasta, so falling asleep was easy this time. It was a bright summer day. I was hanging out with a bunch of friends, mainly playing games and talking about our lives. That night, we decided to dare each other into performing dastardly stunts. One of us jumped out a third story window, another pranked the vice principal of our school. When it was my turn, they decided to dare me to run through the local cemetery and back and repeat this action three more times. So, I ran through once, twice, three times, and that's when I blacked out. I woke up in the same dark room as the other one in my first nightmare. I was tied up to that same wooden slab. The room still reeked of human decay. It didn't look much different from before. I also realized that I was able to move. Well, hypothetically because I was practically immobilized by being tied up to the wooden slab. So I began to struggle. My actions caught the attention of the same figure who was standing next to what appeared to be a small laboratory. He turned towards me, staring me down with those same unnatural, demonic red eyes. You woke up, he said, still using that crazed, fearsome rasp. Too bad, I haven't finished the serum yet. I panicked. He was going to inject me with that same paralysis serum, thus suppressing my ability to struggle. I couldn't believe myself. I was still struggling to get free, even though I knew it was no use. But I guess it's human nature to want to be free. That's when I felt a shock. He violently injected the needle into my neck. I screamed in agony as the syringe pierced my spine, allowing the serum to flow freely and disable my nervous system, completely immobilizing me. Now, where were we? He told himself, 
grabbing his cart of surgical tools. The last thing I heard was a demonic chuckle and the words, sweet dreams. Then I felt an extreme shock of pain through my chest as he stabbed me. I woke up. I was celebrating to myself because the experiment was successful. I managed to disprove the superstition that dying in your dreams makes you die in real life. At least, that's what I thought. I felt a brief shock of pain through my chest. Then, I noticed the rope burns around my wrists and ankles. I also felt serious pain on the back of my neck. But I never realized the vividness of my dream until I took a look at my chest. And right there was a giant scar right above the location of the human heart. You awoke in a cold sweat from your dream, looking around the dim room with a fright. You didn't remember anything that happened in it except for a loud bang at the end, but you passed it off as just a nightmare. It had been a recurring nightmare you've had for the past few days now. You slowly arose from your bed, preparing your lunch for the day, before heading off to work stopping at a local store to pick up a little something along the way. As you drove, you reflected on your life before now, how your life partner has recently passed away from an unknown cancer at such a young age, how your children had recently graduated from college and now were living on their own with a decent paying job and a date as well. You felt happy and proud of them, but you couldn't help but feel a certain feeling inside. It was like a sickness. It was a feeling of despairing emptiness. You went to your small cubicle and started to get to work at your small desk. Your job was a fairly decent one that paid well in this day and age, considering the economy, but it was monotonous. You felt after a while all you were doing was pressing the same keys over and over and moving your mouse around to give commands to a rather outdated personal computer. You had been repeating these same tasks for the past years with no raise or any comfort at home to make things better, realizing that you are all alone now. After a few hours of this miserable process, came lunchtime. And do you know what that meant? You quickly got up, bringing your lunchbox along with you as you moved to where everybody else was eating. Stanley, a co-worker and a close friend here, waited for you at the water dispenser. He was wearing his usual work attire, a white shirt over black dress pants and a small red tie. He greeted you happily as you walked over to him adjusting his brown glasses. You liked Stanley. He was a pleasure to chat with, at least at first. But the dullness settled in quickly as well. The two of you always ended up talking on the same subjects and discussions during every lunch hour, but you were afraid to admit to him that he was becoming boring. That everything was, in fact but you were afraid of how he would react to that. That he just as might care too much over you. You didn't want to shock and surprise him too much. He did, however, speculate that you were becoming increasingly more empty and bitter. But you always assured him that you were fine, and he stopped pursuing his questions. After a few minutes of this worthless congregation, you set off to eat your lunch for today. It was always the same every day, a ham sandwich with a banana. Sometimes you bought a soda, other times it was a mere water bottle. A few years ago, back when your loved one was still roaming the earth, she would sometimes throw in something else, even if it was just a something as plain as a simple pickle. You were always delighted over it. It was a break from the same food every day. Nowadays, you didn't have enough time to throw in a little extra something, 
but you were certain that you had quite a surprise for today. You consumed a sandwich very quickly, without hesitation, with your fruit to follow. Nobody seemed to notice how fast you were eating your food. It was almost too easy, you thought. This is when you usually return to your cubicle to get back to work. But today, you had that little extra. From your bag, you withdrew a small handgun you had just picked up from your last paycheck earlier that morning. Nobody noticed it for a few seconds before a woman started to scream and point at the sight of the revolver. Some of them begged you to stop, reaching out to you. They were trying to talk you into not doing it. You barked at them, making empty threats that you would shoot anybody that gets within touching distance. You felt bad about it. You were really a nice and caring person. One of them quickly phoned the police, saying that they were going to get you help. You didn't care. The dullness, the melancholy, the emptiness, it all had to end. You looked at the crowd, Stanley standing at the front. He pleaded with you, begging you to consider your thoughts and actions. He offered to help you if you were to listen to him. Without saying a word, you opened your mouth and placed a pistol inside of it. You heard the masses scream before your vision faded to black as you pulled the trigger. You awoke in a cold sweat from your dream, looking around the dim room with a fright. But you didn't remember anything that happened in it, except for a loud bang at the end. But you passed it off as just a nightmare. It had been a reoccurring nightmare you've had for the past few days now. You slowly arose from your bed, preparing your lunch for the day, before heading off to work, stopping at a local store to pick up a little something along the way. Have you ever had one of those dreams where you dream you're doing something only to wake up and realize you're almost acting out your dream in real life? The most common instance of this is it's completely normal wet dream, though there are many other common instances, especially in sleepwalkers, where you see yourself walking along a path, only to wake up and find yourself actually walking somewhere, and other similar scenarios. I, despite no longer being a sleepwalker, have one such story myself from my childhood. The year was 1996. I was five years old and had recently lost my great-grandmother. I was having these weird, ongoing nightmares at the time, where someone would call my name. I'd get up, walk in their direction, only to be brutally murdered in any number of ways. I remember being strangled, stabbed, hung, drawn and quartered, fed to the animals, and my personal favourite, being pushed into a wood chipper. Often, the voice calling me would be someone I actually knew, whether it be my parents, a friend from school, a teacher, my sister, or Lenny Kravitz asking me, are you going to go my way? Even at five, I had an appreciation for good music, but I'm starting to get off track. Anyway, there is one particular nightmare that will forever haunt me. This time, it was my recently deceased great-grandmother calling to me. Wookie, she called. I was a really hairy baby, so, so that nickname stuck for a while with the grandparents, the aunties, the uncles. Wookie, come give Nan a hug. I have to go now. I remember getting to my feet and lazily dragging myself out of the room in the direction of a voice. Like I said, my nightmares seemed to have an ongoing theme, so even though I was walking toward my great-grandmother, I was expecting her to transform into a dragon and bite me in half, or for a ninja to leap from behind the wall and put countless shurikens into my skin, or even a tank just to drive through the wall next to me and crush me under its treads. 
They usually woke up instantly after dying anyway, so it had stopped being overly threatening. Anyway, I continued to walk down the narrow hallway toward the frail old lady, arms outstretched. And suddenly, a loud explosion woke me from my sleep. I woke with a start, standing in the hallway outside of my room, peering into the blackness of the quiet family home. I turned around, stumbling sleepily back to my room, remembering the dream like a far-off memory. And directly in front of me, the window that once sat above my bed sat empty, shattered, with its glass fragments dug into my mattress, exactly where I would have been had I not been sleepwalking. To this day, I don't know what caused the window to shatter, nor how the glass had managed to embed itself so deeply into the bed. Nor do I know if my sleepwalking was a lucky coincidence that saved my life, or an intervention from another being. If you're looking for a nice, clean ending where everything is wrapped up and explained nicely, I'm sorry to disappoint. I've been searching for the answers too. Regardless, sometimes the things that scare us most are those that we'll never be able to rationally explain. Please subscribe and like if you love my channel.